Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for coming. We have a terrific uh, panel of experts, academics from different parts of the globe. And we have the great guest, uh, Raiko Gudelic, a celebrated filmmaker who wrote a, a terrific book that I think everybody will enjoy. I encourage you to buy. There is a link on uh, where you register. So um, I think you will be in for a, for a wonderful treat. So uh, without further ado, very quickly, I will introduce to everyone. And uh, although I do believe that you have already their bios, I will just be very brief. Um, we have uh, from Boston, Aida Vidan, who is a, a an expert in Slavic languages and literature and film, and she's a documentary filmmaker uh, from the Cinematheque in Belgrade, joining us, uh, and a scholar from the US, uh, uh, Sami Rucker Chang, and she is uh, uh, doing her research there and coming back in a few days back to the US. Thank you for joining us. Uh, from London, Eric Gordy, a friend supporter who is uh, uh, also um, an expert in all things from former Yugoslavia, including cinema. Uh, from Seattle, I believe, Gordana Cernkovic, another expert and professor of Slavic and comparative literature, cinema and media. And uh, my name is Vera. I am the founder and director of Southeast European Film Festival, which is a cultural festival that does programs like this in addition to movies. Uh, so without further ado, um, I think we will just uh, um, maybe start with uh, Aida, who has written a preface to the book and has written the manuscript many times and can just ease us into the book and uh, how she felt on a personal level, not just as a scholar. Thank you, Vera, for this wonderful introduction and hello to our audience, uh, wherever you are uh, on this uh, globe in whichever corner. Um, this book uh, has come at uh, one of the most difficult times for all of us, I believe. Uh, and at the same time, it infused so much positive energy, so much hope, uh, uh, such a vast perspective on not only professional filmmaking, but what it means to be a human in our difficult, uh, complex world, uh, what it means to move on this globe and enter different communities, uh, different intellectual and artistic spheres. Um, uh, uh, it, it's a humbling, it shares so many humbling experiences uh, and I encourage everybody uh, to take this book to a lovely coffee place and, and just start turning the pages and our uh, intention today is to uh, emulate just that, uh, to, to sort of pretend that we are in a coffee place in Sarajevo, Zagreb, Belgrade, Split, Boston, London, you know, Seattle, wherever we are, and engage in, in, in this uh, conversation with, with uh, Raiko, who, who has so much to, to share and offer to, to us. And just to ease us into the conversation, so these uh, migratory paths that, that we see in the book and that we also sense in, in your films, these interactions, and looking at also your own personal path, your family's path, which you share is German, Slavic, Jewish, lived in a huge number of countries. So these migrations and also migrations at your point of initiation into film where you changed one Slavic culture for another Slavic culture, but it was still a cultural shock and then transgression to you know, America. Uh, the importance of migration and, and, and the kind of empathy and I know eye-opening experience that that it provides one how how has that played out in, in your life mm -hmm. <laughs> you're on the spot you're on the spot okay I will try I'll try to do my best uh, yes it's book about exile in many different forms and it's some kind of autobiography through different kind of stories. Uh, there was no my intention to write the book. From the very beginning, I start just to put some stories for the films, which I will never shoot because they are too expensive. <laughs> when you are born in the small country and you are working in the small film industry, which is not film industry, which is handmade movies industry, then you are thinking 
about not four person in the room, but let's have two persons because it's need to be small. Once I decide in 1991 that I will end that my career with the film, that I don't want to shoot any film more, I decide to start to write stories for the films which cost hundred millions and more. I suddenly find freedom of writing something which I was never allowed to write. I never allowed myself to write such stories. So then I start to collect in, in computer those stories and some other stories, some family stories, some, some stories about other people and so and so on. And suddenly I have something like, probably if I print this thousand pages of different small stories. And as I'm writing with, for last 20 years, my scripts for the film with Ante Tomic, one much younger and better writer than I am. Uh, once, because we are writing in the studio where I'm right now in, in Ohio, uh, once I show him few of those stories and he started to push that I need to publish this and push and push and push. And after two years, I sent manuscript and a publishing Croatia. It was, have three editions. It was very well received. Then it was in Serbia, even better received. There was four editions and 8,000 copies and so on and so on. And then now it's, to be published in a few days in Macedonia and then next year in Prague and Ljubljana in Slovenia and Czech Republic. And then on the top, thanks to Aida, uh, she found everything. She found publisher, she found how to form the book and everything else. So she is a mother of American version of this book. That's the whole short short story um gordana why don't you tell us your personal uh, you know feelings as you were reading yeah and, uh, yeah well um, I kept, I kept. <laughs> okay well let let me try to keep it as as short or shorter than Raikov, because obviously um well so I mentioned that I read the manuscript of this book to, to recommend it for publication. And after about 10 pages of reading it, I was like, publish, publish, publish. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, was, it was a huge help in the summer of 2020 um, during the height of pandemic in the US. Uh, we were in a lockdown in Seattle and I couldn't take myself and my family back to Zagreb. And I'm also very much um, a Zagrebian, Zagrebchanka. Like I really feel that that's my one only identity. I'm not a Seattleite, I'm not really American. I'm not quite Croatian. They don't quite take me as the real one there because I have also a very mixed uh, background. And so it was really hard not to be able to go back to Zagreb for, for the summer and to stay here. And on top of it, we had fires in Oregon and California. And um, friends from California came up and stayed with us. So we were in a lockdown and then fires and smoke started um, around Washington state. And there was this red, red alert, like the air quality was really, really bad. So we were in one home, uh, many of us of many generations are young, people, um, you know, I have kids who are now in their 20s, they were really not happy with sharing that space with us. And so it was, we, we did the best we could, it was fine. Um, but this book really provided uh, a window out, it provided uh, hope, it provided just not one other world, it really gave me so many other worlds. And um, people to meet. It was almost like these stories are about all these people that Raiko met 
And I was just so happy to learn about them. Like that, um, okay, I'll, I'll stop quickly, but the man he's writing about, whose name I cannot, the, the Spanish born man who went to Czechoslovakia and USSR and Cuba and back to Spain. I mean, his story, Honorario, I think is his first name. Honorio Rancaño. Thank you, Rancaño and Valencia. It was just like such a beautiful gift to learn about this man. So it was just, um, you know, it was, it was really a help. It was like a helping hand in form of a book. And I really appreciated the, the format. I could start and end anywhere. I kind of flipped back and forth. I read it all. Um, and, you know, on a more personal level, there are these stories that really put missing pieces of puzzle into my own story. Cause I happen to have been like the last generation of students that had Raiko's father as a professor. Of, of aesthetics at the University of Zagreb philosophy department. And I still remember um, Nadezhda Cecinovic, then Nadezhda Cecinovic Puchowski walking into the classroom one day and she just told us what happened that our professor just passed away and she just could not talk. She started crying and, and left. So there were all these little bits and pieces, not to mention that um, Samoyednam se ljubi, or um, one, one loves only once, or Melody haunts my reverie is, is how it's, it's been done in English. It was a generational film for many of us born in the 60s. I remember um, me and my, myself and friends from, we were just between high school and college coming out of the theater after we saw that film and we literally, we couldn't talk and then we said, what are we gonna do? Like, what's gonna happen? What can we do? I mean, it was really, it was just like, so in so many ways, uh, Raiko's work has, and his family, I know Eva Gerlich's um, autobiography well, it really interacted with the families and people that I know in my own personal history. And then this book was just a lovely, lovely, way of encouragement of of saying you know this too shall pass look at all these people look at me i'm here i was really kind of beat up quite a bit and i'm still alive and and like really doing these amazing things so thank you Gordana. um uh, let me move to um um Sunny, this is a, a book that takes us to many places, many different people. So you would think, I did not know what, exactly what to expect because I know the movies and most of, of his films. But then it started, these are the, it's it really, you know, I think, you know, this could be a movie, this should be a movie, and this too should be a movie. So there are so many wonderful stories that tell the destinies of people that are scattered all over. And that's our destiny too. All of us have the mixed background. None of us is just one thing. And uh, so uh, tell us a little bit, how do you see that? Because it's, you know, the, the, from what I've, a little bit that I read about your research, you know, tell us how this strikes you when all of a sudden, so we jump from, from uh, the former Czechoslovakia and then we are in Mexico and we are everywhere. Uh, so, so these paths of exile that, you know, shape, our human destiny. So tell us, how do you feel about that? Sure. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, so I was reading this actually while I was traveling. And in many ways, it was sort of the opposite journey, right? Because I'm from Ohio. So yes, I'm a scholar of Southeast Europe, but I'm from Ohio. I teach in Ohio. Um, even though I meant to leave, I never really did. So it was interesting to sort of be making that opposite journey. And I was really curious to know how Ohio featured within the book, right? Because one of the biggest surprises for my, for my colleagues and for students is when and if we watch these films or when my colleague says, oh, this, is a, this actually happened a few years ago where they said, you know, we have this partnership with University of Zagreb and there's this great film that just came out called The Constitution by Reiko Gerlich. And I was like, well, he's just up the road. We should invite him. 
and people go, Michael Gerlich is in Ohio, right? So I was really interested to see how Ohio featured. And it was, and it was wonderful to just see the, and, and not to be too sort of nativist in this way, but I was really interested to see how that very much was just if it fused in. It was just parts of the story. And it was part of this bigger picture of identity that is sort of woven throughout. And it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't stand out, but rather it is woven in. And so I was looking for that, but I was also just sort of picking stories here and there as is suggested in the beginning of the book. Um, I've kind of felt like uh, reading Pavich in that way where it's you just sort of pick and choose, right? What, what, what works for you. And so I found some really interesting stories that I would love to talk a little bit more about, but in terms of the different identities and the, the idea of being in exile, I feel that, but I also feel that as being just a person of the world, right? The fact that um, all of these different European cities could be, you know, positioned right alongside of Athens. I just, you know, it was just a wonderful, wonderful exploration in that way. Thank you. And uh, Eric, your take uh, on, on, on Raiko, and then we will just start, you know, like uh, bombarding him with questions. No, 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 just go home. <laughs> You're, yeah, you're sitting back. Hey, they do, they do the work. Compliments. <laughs> <laughs> we will do. We will do the uh, the heavy lifting, Raiko, for you. So, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I think everyone else here is like a, is like a film or or an art person. I'm I'm not a film or an art person. I just come to this as a uh, um, as a fan. Um, and uh, yeah, I could say I. I mean, I thought the book was super, but but everybody thinks that this doesn't make me unique. Um, I can uh, I can tell you what surprised me most uh, about the book, and it was not a story about uh, um, about a, a great uh, film director or or about a celebrity, um, but about uh, but about Barba Nico and uh, Farska in Brač because I had the pleasure of, uh, of of meeting him. He is no longer alive, and he was one of only two people who live permanently in Farska, and the only one who had a vineyard. So you would go in the morning with your empty liter bottle of mineral water to get uh, the wine for the day. And he had red wine, but he would only sell you white wine if he knew your family. Um, so it's uh, so it's that kind of, uh, it's that kind of community. Um, but I have actually, um, I have got a question for for Raiko Gerlich, if uh, if I can be permitted to ask him a question. Of course, of course, go ahead, go ahead. Unfortunately, yes. Yes. Okay. He's been too comfortable. Um, He's been too comfortable. Put him on the spot. Okay, because uh, um, look, I know that the book is about a lot of stuff and uh, um, uh, many themes, many stories, and so on. But uh, um, but the main thing that I think it's it's about is is identity, or at least this is what I get from it. And especially the way that identity constantly comes into collision with experience um, in a way that is sometimes tragic, but, but certainly transforms both of them. Um, so what I want to ask you is, what's the deal with identity and especially these ones that uh, um that other people just like to slap upon you either because uh because they think they're great and they think or they think that you're awful um and uh um and how does how does this blend into the experience of uh, of of being a living human being who may have a lot of uncertainties or dilemmas about identity? I hope that this is not a confusing question. Um, it is, or... but I will try to answer. <laughs> uh, you know, I grew up in a country named Yugoslavia, and no one ever asked me about identity identity was just part of the family stories. This grandmother came from there and they're coming from here. My mother was born in Budapest to rise in Sarajevo and then spend the life in Zagreb. But that was just a family stories. Those stories never hurt someone, never attack someone. 1991, a few years before, I did a film in the Jaws of Life where I start to play with this because then I start to feel that it's becoming something, some big issue for the small country. And when it's really started, then you're on daily basis ask or in newspapers or on the street who you are. Are you Croat 100% or not? 
and that was just two categories of people suffered. As I am from mixed family, I was never enough good crop. This is one of the things which propel me and that's how I end up here. And not that someone want to hurt me, no one was killed in my family. Uh, everything was fine, except that you don't feel comfortable. And that's much deeper story will go on, which we have luckily no time to explain. But yes, that from then on, that's why I put in the book exactly the numbers, blood numbers of my family, who is and where I'm coming from, because so many times asked that it start to be funny. And now it's funny. I don't take this anymore seriously. It's happened again and again from here. The right wing newspapers, I'm always bloody Chetnik, Serbs, Yugoslav, whatever you want to call. Everyone there can call everyone as he or she wants. That's something which is lost completely any sense. So identity is something which basically you are trying to find for yourself inside yourself and keep for yourself. You are not playing. I think that identity as sexuality, as religion is something very, very intimate things which you need to keep for yourself and try to find your position toward those things. Eric, as a sociologist, give us a little bit of a, of a perspective on this, uh, uh, because it's not just Raiko. We all are facing similar, uh, we all have similar stories. So, and now we have the culture wars here and we have uh, this questioning here in, in, in this country. So give us your, your perspective on this. Well, I guess, I mean, the reason that, that I found all of these vignettes so, so enlightening I mean, what uh, what Raiko said at the end is that you know identity is something intimate for the self. I mean, on the other hand, everybody who has ever crossed a border, right, um, or taken part in a religious ceremony, um, knows that the problem with uh, with identity being something intimate and inside the self is that there are all of these other these other selves and institutions that don't permit it to develop it that way, right? It, uh, um, it becomes Im imposed in ways that, uh, um, that might resonate with your experience and, uh, and, and, and might not. And, and this was something that I thought was so beautiful in the stories is the way that it captures the complexity of this dissonance. No, I, they try to put you in the box. It's easier to manipulate with the people when you are in certain box with the label on the top and they know exactly how to do and what to do with you. All my life as everyone, I'm trying to run away from any box. I don't want to be in the box. With my films, with everything. Reko. <laughs> yes. Hey, go ahead. Uh, Reko, this uh, actually topic uh, links so nicely uh, to your uh, last film, Constitution, uh, where we see exactly this rift between official identity politics and the quest for individual freedom. Um, so in one of the interviews that I heard uh, about this film, you say that Vieko Kral, who is the principal uh, protagonist of this film, and who's very right wing, but at the same time, very controversial, complex uh, personality, because he, in his entire life, he, he's been trying to come out as, as gay to his uh, uh, Ustasha father and the community, and he suffered a lot about, uh, in, in the process. So at the end of this, um, he goes back to this classroom he's a history teacher and he teaches prescribed history of Croatia and the region uh, you say that he's going to that he's sort of entrapped in the in in this uh, uh, role that he has uh, where do you see the, the catharsis in, in, in this kind of character is there in other words a way out of, of this trap no I don't believe I think that those kind of people which have those different characters inside are battling those characters until the end of the world. That, that's something, you, it's a stereo, it's not mono. 
And I think that 99% of people are scared. They have different characters inside and they are dealing with them. In case of this uh, character, it's, it was very, two very different characters. So it's, they are visible. Usually we have something which we can hide and present ourselves as a one person. But in case of him, that was a multiplayer character. So that's, but you know, when you're making film, you are trying to push your characters to the edge because then they will talk more clearly about who they are. So in your own life, you are trying to do opposite. You are running away from edge and you are trying to keep yourself inside. But I'm talking a lot, you are here. <laughs> well, can, can I add something to Aida's question? Because uh, uh, in, in that film, which, which is terrific, by the way, my, my favorite scene is the one where the, um, the history teacher who, yeah, he's like a history teacher and a fascist and a, um, and a closeted gay guy, and, and he has it tough. And one student comes up to him at the end of the class and asks him, I'm paraphrase, paraphrasing, um, asks him, how, how do you learn to be honest with, your, with yourself? Or uh, how do you prepare to do this? And the teacher's answer is basically, you can't. This, this was an impressive moment for me. That's one crucial moment for him too, because he's first time out with, and so on. I will not interpret my thoughts. <laughs> I'm not no, no. We, we won't go there. Uh, uh, Sunny, uh, so what is your take on, um, um, on identity? So I would say in terms of the, the questions of personal identity, it's, it's, I'm in a very different situation because there's never been a question of me being a, a belonging or not being different, right? So I come to this field, I come to this region as already marked, I, in my country, I'm already marked. So the question of identity is probably a bit different um, than the one that, you, that, that is being asked in the region, right? So maybe the question is, and this is a question I think that is frequently asked, and I think this is what you mean, is when did you realize that you were different? Or when did you realize that you stood out from others around you? And it's a different question for everybody. And I appreciate um, this idea that it is something that you define for yourself and maybe you kind of keep it in that space. And irrespective of what other people are telling you, you get to keep that. Um, I'd actually, if, if we could move, I would like to ask a question because I haven't yet. Um, one, of, one of the things that I was really happy to find out, and again, going back to this Ohio thing, which I never do, but I was really curious, I learned about the documentary, How Ohio Pulled It Off. And this is one that I had never seen before. And so I spent quite a bit of time trying to find it and was very glad to find it. And it's now has some age to it. But in that 2007, I believe that documentary is sort of it, it, in, in an American context and even thinking about identity because I think it could slip into that. Um, what is exposed in that documentary is now in many ways a playbook. And what if we had seen that film more or had that had come out more, more people had seen it, where might we have been? And so um, I'm really curious to know, uh, Reiko, how did that project come together? And where, has, where, did, where was it screened? And just any more information that you might be able to tell me about that would be great. Uh, uh, I used to run master class in graduate program and I was able to select students, three, four maximum, and spend with them a year or two. So once four of them came and asked if they can apply for the master class, and I say yes, but I, I have no interest to do short films. If you want to do together something bigger, I will be happy to help. And they didn't find the team. And at that time, it was all over newspapers that Bush Jr. probably did some dirty job with the vote, votes in Ohio. And I said, I'm giving you one month. Go and try to see if this can be documentary film. They spent a month. They came back with some great information and we spent three and a half years doing the film. Uh, 
I didn't allow, I was some kind of producer and professor. It was, we have twice a week meetings for five hours uh, in this room and uh, I didn't allow them to put in the film something which is not 100% sure. They need to be sure. It's not Michael Moore film. He's a very nice filmmaker, but he just accused someone and ran away without anything proving and so on. So that was a long process. And uh, we premiered in the, in the town near here. And the film was, I think they sold to 24 or 26 countries around the world. Uh, so I was so shocked when I found out that Croatian television even bought the film. <laughs> I didn't know that. So at the end, they make some little money because in documentary films, they are no money. But uh, it helps them a lot to find a job in film industry. In Argentina, it's all over where they were coming from. So yes, that was a very nice experience doing this. They were shooting, bringing material, we were watching, editing, and then I said, here is missing something, go there. And little by little they put, and I think it's important film for American democracy. Absolutely, that's why I was hoping that you could tell me a bit more about yes. it. Yes, so yes, it was shown all over the world. And, and they said that some, now when it was Trump election, also some television, because this is about elections. How easy is to go around election in this country? Uh, Gordana, um, yes, go ahead, please. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, well, just to tie on to this, I, I would first just like to say, um, I really like the to get back to the book. I really like the fact that that for me the book really shows identity as almost being undefinable um, because it's so complex, and that's what I loved because these categories are just incredibly random almost, and you know. I really saw the identity coming out of the book or the world of the book as being one of relations with artists, with filmmakers. And then you think, okay, so it's not obviously a national community, it's not political community, it's the artist community, but then it goes wider, filmmakers, artists, and it really gets to this very human um, and humanistic um, view and practice of the world and, and relationships. And I, I love the food stories where Raiko and his wife basically recreate this little Yugoslavia with the Serbian couple from Belgrade and the Sarajevo couple who do not want to meet each other. And then eventually Raiko and Olga decide, you know, this is ridiculous and collect everyone around food, which was wonderful. So, so it's like, it was really this very humanistic thing. Like I'm friends with everyone who is kind, good, smart, interesting, intelligent, you know, good intended. And those friendships make me. It's a very relational identity, which I really loved. It's not this very narcissistic uh, new way of seeing it. It's all about me. And I'll tell you my, you know, memoir, even if I'm like 13 year old and nothing happened to me, I'll write a memoir. So I really appreciated the fact that Raiko even wrote stories about him as if he was writing them from the outside. It was really, there is no sentimentality, there is no emotion. It's almost like he's seeing himself from the outside. I cry as I think, okay, I might die and I might not finish the film, but these thoughts are not really spelled out. I really appreciated that kind of tone and humbleness, but um, so that's just my thoughts about identity. I, I love the book because it totally explodes all these really simplifying things. And, you know, what is my national community? I don't have it. Um, and I don't think anyone does, honestly. I, I think it's a totally artificial, um, political, you know, institutional, definitely construct. So, but my question is about teaching. Um, given that Raiko talked about his work with the students, 
you know, some filmmakers, they have teaching jobs almost as kind of secondary, like we, you know, it's a, it's a steady job, it's a whatever. But Riker, you seem to really, really take it very seriously and, and really have relationships with your students and, and did that CD-ROM. And pedagogy seems to be really important for you. And I love those relationships, teachers, students that you talk about, like the relationship with your um, Slovak, Czech Slovak professor, uh, Klaus, right? The, the, the co-director of Shop on the Main Street. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your teaching um, interacts to your filmmaking? Like, how do you know? Uh, do you get inspired by students? Do you keep friends with them? Um, you talked a little bit about the book about the difference between stu film students in Croatia and film students in the U.S. In the sense that those in the U.S. will just have, with luck, with effort, with talent, have some chance of becoming filmmakers and that it's much harder in Croatia and it can breed uh, cynicism. So I, if you could just talk a little more about your work as a teacher, um, I would really love to hear more about it. Thank you. I will try to say in just, I was lucky. Uh, uh, I was invited to run the master class at NYU. A graduate Fish School of Arts, and that was very fancy uh, place because I was running first class, uh, first year Arthur Penn third, and Spike Lee second. So you are among those people, and blah blah blah. When you are among such a people, you got invitation from twenty university in next three months. So that's one of invitation was Ohio University, and then. I learn it's not just teaching, it's not just teaching position, it's called eminent scholar position. Uh, so I am not paid by my university, I'm paid by governor of Ohio. I have freedom to come and to go without saying why and how. Uh, I can select students if I want to make a big project. So I'm spending here between four and six months every year. So I have all the freedom to prepare here my films and to go to shoot in Europe and so on. So when I'm selecting them, I, I really try to do something with them. And because in this interaction with them, I, I feel that I am learning even more than they are learning from me. I'm learning the completely new way of thinking, how they're approaching things. It's something I'm refreshing myself. And, and that's something which helps me a lot to stay alive mentally. Uh, so three years ago or two years ago, before COVID, three, we spent four years on one project. Uh, and it was a feature film and it was proclaimed the best student feature in America. And that was done by one guy from Venezuela, from Turkey, from Iran, and one American. So four of them spent a huge amount of time writing the script and doing that. So it's, it's some kind of role of producer teacher. I'm taking them step by step through. And I learned that the only way I can teach them is to teach them on the stuff which they produce, because it's much more painful for them than if I'm showing my scenes and how I did it, that's something. So I'm not torturing them with my films. I'm torturing them with their own films. Thank you. Uh, Raiko, if, I know that in the audience we have some young uh, filmmakers and I was hoping uh, that's a really noble mission that, that you have both on the artistic front and educational front. Uh, and I was just wondering your take, how in this complicated film industry does one actually get to make the film between American or Western commercialism and, and, and then all the, you know, as we talked earlier, identity politics and politics that close in the picture no matter what, uh, uh, how does one get out and make anything? 
I think that if you really wish, you will, it will happen to you. That's what my logic to the whole life. So uh, not that everything happened to me, but uh, I found quite early being in this country that I will never make the film here for many reasons. But the main reason is I don't feel enough pain for people here, people around me. I, I don't know them enough to tell the stories about. So I decided this is my educational part of my life and there is my filmmaker's part of the life. So I'm trying to move between those two worlds. Um, the story is there is something which I have feeling that I need to tell because they are painful. They, they are, we live there in society which is going Okay, we are not going there. <laughs> we are not going to politics. No. Uh, but it's it's something which uh, I I found some kind of balance between those two, such a different world, and I'm still doing this. I think that this is coming to the end quite soon, because traveling became a huge issue. Yes. I'm 75 years old. It's not a joke anymore to travel 20 hours from Zagreb to Ohio. So we're thinking seriously about ending and going back. And going back means going to Istria and live there. Can I um, uh, ask you to tell us that Istria seems to be like your, um, uh, your mini homeland. Uh, where you feel quite comfortable and probably most comfortable of all the places that you've been. Um, I'm sure it's wonderful in Ohio from everything that I read in your book. You really, really enjoyed it. Uh, but tell us about this Istria that almost becomes in your book this mythical place that, you know, I said, well, I should move there, you know, like the, and I've been there, but, but you know, it's suddenly, you know, I'm seeing it through different eyes. So, um, so you build this, you know, you were uh, one of the founders, you're the founder, the artistic director of the Motobun Film Festival, which is a wonderful independent film festival, very well uh, uh, respected uh, uh, on the festival circuit. So, and there's the wine and there are friends. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that, that um, microcosm of Istria, what it does for you and how you derive your inspiration from it, from the land, from that connection that you have, from that one small piece of land. Istria is something in between Croatia and Italy. It was a territory for a few thousand years, every 15 years someone came and and run the country and so on and so on. So it's the people there are much more tolerant than people in the rest of Croatia. No one ever asked me who I am in Istria, what nationality, what religion, what they learn for centuries to live among different. So this is something which is very important when you decide to live in Croatia, to live in such an environment. Uh, next, it's a mix of Mediterranean and uh, Central European culture, the climate, uh, everything uh, is something as a mix. So it's fantastic country, it looks great, it's produced fantastic wines and it's five or six years in a row, the best olive oil region in the world. So even I'm producing with my wife, Oliver. So we really enjoy, and this Corona gave us chance to live in 16 months in one piece there, because usually we were coming just through in the summer and we enjoy and decided that that's the place where we will live. Thank you. Gordana has a question, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so this is very personal. I really apologize to the audience. This is this is the very Zagreb centered question. So I love Istra. It's like my second home to for for very similar reasons. I managed to to go for two months to um, whatever our, our former region, our current region and, and spend a long time in Istria. 
but I'm still at heart a Zagrebian. So again, this is a very local patriot question. The same here. Yeah, I mean, would you consider we have a new government, new local government in Zagreb after a long time of a very, very bad right wing mayor, uh, the new, you know, the new people are trying at least to to change things with Tomasiewicz, a uh, new mayor. It's super hard. It's there is just so much corruption, so much issues and so much rise of primitivism that you write in the preface to your book is really hard to to even just stop let alone to con contract but as you said for for four generations you know your family has been trying to to make just a little bit of difference and progress in culture in in humanity in in thinking um, in that region. So I am very sad to hear that you would not consider something like Istria and Zagreb, you know, as opposed I mean, to I mean, oh, yes, I like live in Istria, but do workshops in Zagreb, be there at Adu, uh, you know, have students have a chance to interact with you back, back home and not just in Zagreb, obviously in the whole region, but you have so much to give, I think, uh, I just don't want to see you say you're retiring in Istria. That's all. And I, again, I really apologize. I'm sorry. Oh, fine. I'm in the same position. I, I want to live in Istria and uh, I have an apartment in Zagreb, which I will not give up. You need every few months to walk some streets and to feel some urban space. No, no. And, and I have a majority of my friends lives in Zagreb, so I will not give up. Uh, on Zagreb, but Istria is something which is a really fairy tale for us. It's yeah. fantastic environment. It is. It is. So it is. Uh, yeah. we have uh, a few of the comments here in the chat. If uh, you would like to, um, uh, re I mean, some are pretty long, but um, anyway, this is the um, uh, Lubisha boy who says that he remembers Raika from his Playboy interview. And uh, uh, so he's writing a book and he will be quoting you. So I'm very glad that it looks like, you know, this is an intimate group. We all know each other, really. And uh, so, but tell us um, when um, you say you, you won't ever make a movie here, you don't know and you don't feel this place, the U.S. as, as intimately as you do your home uh, country, whatever, the, we won't say which, and now it could be the small land of Istria. Uh, but, you know, currently we have a program here in Los Angeles, Vienna in Hollywood, mm -hmm. where oh. they are, you know, so they're, ta again, talking about exile, your book is about exile, and we have these famous exiles, not all of them, not all of them. Brecht did not really succeed here. He did not feel okay in Hollywood. So, not everybody succeeded, but some of them did, and famously so. Uh, so how do you comment on that? What is that? Uh, is it that their experience was so terribly tragic, what they were coming from, um, that you know maybe that propelled them to do the films that they did? And even you know Billy Wilder was writing in, in, in partnership with uh, uh, another writer, like you do with Ante Tomic, but you know, he wrote this wonderful script here. He captured that, that, that mentality. And so can you comment on this? Uh, so there are different types of exiles. And no, no, for sure. Especially the group you mentioned, that's fantastic. From Lubitsch to Weiler, yeah. from all those guys. They're, they're my favorites in the whole history of Hollywood because they are Central Europeans. In yes. And that's those films are. But no, it's they came with one way ticket. Yeah, I always came with return ticket. If you don't have this to really push you to the edge, you always have this kind of okay, fine, but I will go there to shoot the film. So, yes, that's probably uh, I, I'm writing in the book how Branko Lusti two-time Oscar winner and yeah. big producer and so put the check on the table and say you need to stay here but I didn't feel Los Angeles is the space where I want to live it's I learned 
I met a lot of people. It's not, but this is something when they proposed me some film, I start to feel like electrician on my film. They will prepare everything for you. They will cast you. They will give you the script. You're just coming, and you can direct seven days. If they don't like you, they'll move you. I fight all my life for some kind of independence, and that I can do from comedy to tragedy to move here and there. And watching very carefully, there, if you succeed, you will do the same all your life it's it's trapped somehow so and i was not enough young uh, if you came to hollywood with 20 25 that makes sense to fight uh i can 47 so it doesn't make any sense to fight for small independent film because i used to do films in better conditions and i'll try to keep that so that's why I said, okay, it's enough. But then when Tujman died, I took some money and went to Zagreb and started to shoot the documentary about him and what will happen after him. And once you touch the camera after 10 years, it's like Corona. You got it and you are propelled back to film. Uh, Sunny, uh, tell us for, for the, uh, the, um, this crossover, there are people that are, you know, and I live in a, in a city that, you know, is, uh, um, you can't really put your finger on anything uh, in Los Angeles, it, you really, really can't, and uh, for me it works because uh, for the first time I don't feel like a Martian because I'm among Martians, and that is a great feeling, it's about the city. So at this crossover, so many people from all over, totally unusual people bring their own and they manage somehow to merge that, to make this marriage successful, not always, but many times in music, in art, in, um, in cinema, and they do it here. So um, how do you view this possibility of a crossover and, uh, um, and have you come across examples that you, you felt that are content, you know, um, more recent ones, you know, Vienna and Hollywood was uh, the famous 20s and 30s. Um, so have you um, come across some that you think that uh, how possible is crossover in a world that's interconnected and gone crazy? In terms of, I mean, it seems to me that co-productions and transnational film is is sort of the, the modus, uh, you know, the the mo of, of many films these days. And I think it'd be very difficult to locate sort of um, one set combination of cities because, I mean, it seems to me that there's so much movement, and even talking about a national cinema is a very challenging thing to do anymore. That would be what I would have to say to that. Yes, because I they, for each right. No, no, for each small European film, you need to beg in five, six countries. And the titles of all my films are five, six countries. We are now begging for the new film. We manage in two countries, so now we will try to go because there is no way. So they are all mixed, but they don't influence what you are talking and how you are talking about. That's a huge, it's still so-called culture. There, there are some requirements in, in place and space, right? Though that you need to shoot, or, the, or for some films, you, you have to shoot yeah, yeah, in some places. Um, right? Big countries, they have this kind of rules. Small countries, not. Aida, what about the, this crossover? Uh, well, we are all exiles who not all you know, that, that live here and work here. So, um, in 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 different uh, um, in different professions, how do you feel about this crossover? How possible is it? And and you know, is it just a very very limited audience, or how do we reach beyond our own into some uh, you know the general American audience? How do we do that? How do we go over that? What is uh, um, uh, called that rampa? How do we cross it? 
we have crossover situations. I believe everywhere we have it in film, we have it in academia, we have it in in, in politics, and it seems to me that that essential divide is between. Um, it was in a way contained in my question uh, about how to make your your next film between like uh, financial politics and this more humanistic approach that Cordana talked uh, about. So that that's like the first divide that we have to figure out uh, that the, you know art cannot be run as a business academia cannot be run as business our personal life should not be run as a you know business we all have to survive somehow but but th th this is a large question sort of elephant in the in in the room and i just want to link this to the question of irreverence um, perhaps you know uh, a sort of topic that, that could uh, address some, some of some of these concerns uh in both the book and, and the all of Raiko's films, at least the way I read them, this question of irreverence, the ability to step out of your shoes and look at the world and question the, the world and, and raise that red flag and say, hey, what, what are we doing? You know, should we all subscribe to this one uh, uh, uniform narrative or should we question it and how do we question it? So, uh, Raiko, a question for you. Uh, this also is the, you know, uh, is the matter of humor and the matter of, of, of tragedy and you walk that edge, uh, you navigate it uh, uh, so, so well. Um, I was just wondering how, how do you feel uh, about this you know, irreverence that your narrative seems to be bursting out of it? I, I spent the critical years of my life in Prague. I came like 18, 19 years old boy, and I grew up four and a half years in Prague. So somehow this irony, this warm storytelling and the big irony to our politics and so on, those mix of Central European culture, which I was grown up in my family and I found even stronger in Prague. That, I think, influenced my approach to tragedy or comedy and to play this on the edge. Because, as I said for the last film, but uh, I would like people to watch the film, which is quite dark, with a little smile on the face. And I think that that's the way how you can really give someone opportunity to absorb what you are telling and why you are telling the story. So that's, I think that Prague is somehow, and Zagreb, Zagreb is not so far, Zagreb is just much smaller and um, not so funny as they want to be, but uh, it's the mix of those things. And I was young and it stayed with me until, I, it helps me a lot not just on the film, but in, in the life. This uh, Hashek, this Shweik approach that you can play with, Kundera and Hrabal and those guys, I grow up reading those books. So yes, that's how. There is a moment in the book where you describe your visit to Moscow uh, at the invitation of Mosfilm. And this came almost uh, exactly, I think it's 10 uh, years after the invasion of, of uh, uh, Prague and uh, Czechoslovakia by, by the Soviets. So you find yourself in, in uh, uh, Moscow with a group of other young uh, Yugoslav filmmakers. And you did this wonderful prank where you, with your feet, you you uh, brought uh, Coca-Cola and the logo in the pristine snow in, in Moscow. And, and of course, uh, that was a major provocation, as was your, your official address at this ceremonial dinner when you quoted from uh, Boris Pilniak and Isaac Babel, who were both executed under the Soviet regime. So th this is the kind of irreverence. This was, uh, you know, you, you were very young at that age, but obviously this carried on throughout your career. But I was just wondering oh, how you remember the, these days in, in, in Moscow or elsewhere. Oh, that was a nice, that was a nice journey. There was much longer journey than I described in the book. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, we feel good. Our films were playing around the world. They invited because they will put our films in theaters, so it will have quite a big audience. 
So yeah, we feel like in our shoes quite comfortable. And that's how we behave. Probably we were young, we were much more self-absorbed than we are today. And that was a journey. And we have few journeys like this to France, to because the retrospective of our films at that time were very often because our films play almost regularly in Cannes. And so we were invited all over. And that was a very good group of directors. We grow up somehow in Prague together. So that was some kind, of, we feel very free. And especially when you come to Moscow, which is quite, <laughs> want to keep you in the room, don't go out. Uh, we break all this and find the people. Larissa Shepetsko was, we spend with her a lot and then they kill her off. Now our panel, please ask uh, uh, your last question uh, for the time being uh, for Raiko. And then we will see what other questions we may have in the chat uh, for him. And you know, we, we really have a terrific group here this morning. Just a simple question. Um, I've shown some of your films to my students and I talked a little bit about the Prague background and, you know, showed them Foreman and um, Kader Klosch and uh, Mansell and actually they wondered what are your favorite films other than the Czech school, Czech Slovak school. <laughs> that was the first question and then the second question yeah, I, I knew of Hasek and, and uh, you know, Kundera and Hrabal, we read that, um, but they also wondered like favorite films, favorite books, and then um, I said just a little bit about your biography because it was important to say that while you're making these films that are very centered in, in one area, you've been all around the world, and then their third question was like, how the heck does he go on? Because I, I mean, I literally said, you know, there were a lot of attacks or just unpleasant things. And then he did this and he did that and the teaching and Motun and then another film. And then this film got these awards. I mean, not that that's so important, but it's like, it's a great newest film. So they really wondered, um, you know, best, your, your favorite films, your favorite books and what keeps you, even even keeled and you know making that next step and not saying i'll just give up at 47 and go to istria you know but... i need i'm sorry that i didn't do this <laughs> it's too late now yeah. uh, on the you. question favorite film i'm always answering when i was 20 I think that Buñuel and Bresson are the only filmmakers in the world. <laughs> then I grow up a little bit and then Fellini and Antonioni and Visconti arrived to my life and I was 100% sure that that's the only film. So you are growing up uh, and it's like in human relationship, you're in love with this girl and then 10 years later you're in love with another girl. So it's changing uh it's hard for me to say uh, as i mentioned uh, maybe billy weiler is ideal director for me because he he managed to put together two continents on the best possible way uh, sunset boulevard i probably watch 15 times in my life whenever i'm not well i put this film and watch and I enjoy like Amarcord. You have some of those films which you are taking with you through your life. Uh, books, who? It's also you know when you are young, <laughs> you have Germans and Russians. I, I start with Russian literature. I start with Dostoevsky, Gogol, uh, Chekhov. Uh, I read all. Uh, so that was a huge influence at the beginning. Then I moved to France and so on and so on and so on. 
and now I'm reading a lot of Croatian and Serbian and, and literature from that part of the world because people are sending me. I'm back before arriving here. I always go and put half of my suitcase are the books, 10, 15 books. I don't manage to read all, but I start all and then pick up and read. So, because that's the world which I like to read about, and it's some fantastic writers there. It's, they are really, I'm always surprised every year with the new and with all. Uh, how I managed to survive, it's, I was afraid to stop. I never learned how to stop myself. And I'm still afraid that maybe now it's too late to stop. And this is maybe the last moment to stop and say, okay, fine, thank you, I did it. Now I'm just drinking on the terrace and watching Istria and that's it for me. But I don't know how to do this. I'm very often talking to my friends who have the same problem. We never learn the art of finishing something. We are always going and trying to find because we are afraid the next morning we are dead. Probably. So I don't know. I, I, I need to learn this discipline. Uh, I could maybe perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your the next project, uh, I, I, when we invited you in 2000, I believe seven, right after Bulldog Post came uh, out. Um, and this was the first uh, co-production of all Yugoslav republics and then some other uh, producers. So it had very much, a, um, you know, cultural impact in, in that sense. And you said this was so difficult. This is definitely my last film. And since then there have been like two, three, four <laughs> that, that just keep coming out. Um, and I know that you're working uh, uh, on a new production, which has a very intriguing uh, title uh, and that is loosely connected with Kerleja, but not quite well. So perhaps if you could share with us a little bit about it. I don't want to talk about projects which are not done because you never know if it happened. When you are reading newspapers on, on the internet, you can find that every director is talking the, if you, start to take them seriously they made 300 films so no i, I i'm working for last three years on one project uh, with ante tomic uh, it's based on one one page of kirleja novel narubu pameti on the edge of prison so we try to develop something from basically three, four sentences from this novel. And this is a contemporary story. It's happening now in Zagreb. And it's what can happen to someone who say no. And that's all what I want to say. <laughs> we don't know. If everything is fine, we will shoot next fall. Uh, 30% of budget is still missing. So we don't know if we'll be able to find because in Europe, what used to be quite easy to go around, now it's very hard. Uh, the countries are giving just small portion of what they used to give to the films. So it's not easy. And we are still not 100% happy with the script. So we are corresponding and I hope that next fall will happen. So let's see. We'll be cheering for you. <laughs> Eric and Sunny, um, any uh, questions that you have for Raiko before we have some uh, questions from the audience? Uh, well, maybe since everybody's talking about very nice things, maybe I can talk about um, yeah. um, something really horrible and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last moment. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, um, so I'd say I'd say this that um, um, that the the field in in which you work, I mean arts and culture, is probably the second biggest disappointment to me of uh, um, of the last 20, 30 years. The biggest one would probably be the field that I work in, academics, and and I suppose the third would be religion, right? Because uh, 
you know, the expectation is that academics will deal with knowledge, that arts will deal with understanding, and that religion will, will deal, deal with feeling. And all of them have dealt with it in the most irresponsible and manipulative way. Um, so I wonder, I mean, first of all, whether you, um, whether you, you share my disgust, and then also whether you have some way of explaining it. Uh, I'm sharing, you, but not in that order. For me, the church is the biggest disappointment. In the region where I was born and lived, religion was crucial to the war and religion is crucial today for running those almost Nazi nationalistic states. So, and in Croatia, church have power over everything which is going wrong. So this is huge disappointment that someone who needs to deal with feelings and is basically interesting just in money and power and nothing else so academia too because academia if i'm talking just about croatia uh, you have zagreb university which was once upon the time fantastic university and today they are giving honors to war criminals so it's basically, and it's run by one second-hand priest who is more or less idiot. Uh, and that's how universities just going down and down. The only good example in Croatia is Rijeka, the lady who's running is really trying to make what university needs to be. So, and the third was science in your, you have religion, you art. have academia, and you have art. Art. Oh, that's that's disappointing <laughs> too. <laughs> no, it's it's just as everything else. It's it's through internet uh, spoiled on the level that it's really hard to follow. It's still great art is made, but it's lost in this garbage of everything and everyone can proclaim everything art and this lost this kind of focus what art needs sometimes so but i will those two proclaim the main reason why society in croatia is going back and back and back and it's now somewhere in 18th century Um, Sonny. Yeah, just with a comment more than a question, um, I was going to ask you about the end ish of, of Constitution where they are allowed to adopt a child. But now I know you won't interpret your film, so I won't ask you. What, <laughs> I, will you. Do, <laughs> what I will do, however, is when students ask, I will apply this idea of the darkness and then with a little bit of a smile. I really like that. And I will say that the adoption rather than the birth of a child is the, is the smile in the darkness. So thank you for allowing that. No, yes. But uh, just for your uh, Ante Tomic, which who I'm writing is obsessed with happy endings. I am completely opposite person. <laughs> so we have always huge fights about endings. So it's always some kind of, we try to find compromise. So it's tragic with a smile on the face. That's the reason, no other. Thank you. And we have a question, um, and we can go back and forth from uh, Declan Landell to, um, on the question of relatability. I feel that these films have a massive resonance with American audiences, but there is an, a question of accessibility. Professor Aida Vidan has been absolutely vital in my multi-month effort to obtain access to the border pools. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. But for general American audiences who want to watch your films, are there plans to have them available on more platforms, Raiko? Uh, the four of them are watchable on Amazon Prime. And uh, some of them were in distribution, but distribution in European film with subtitles in America is five cinemas maximum. So it's, it's very limited, as you know, you know, you are in this business, you know how it's hard to 
constitution was distributed, but it was distributed in Kansas three days and here too. <laughs> it was all over. So it, it's uh, not easy. When I arrived to this country, 5% on the screen time was films with subtitles. The last time I checked, which is five days ago, it was 003%. So no one is watching here. And everything now you can watch on those Amazon, Netflix, which I don't consider as serious way of watching the films. But streaming is uh, is winning the war. Uh, yeah, no, no, definitely. And, and small films are disappearing as they disappear in this country forever. Uh, independent cinema doesn't exist anymore here. Everything is on the platforms. So Europe is still trying, old fashioned Europe is still trying to make films for theaters, but it will be quite soon, this story will come to the end. And also in terms of these platforms, I, titles come and go. So there is no, uh, nothing steady. You know, we can go in January and find a film and then you go in March and it's no longer there. And, and, and there is a constant instability of the, of the system and issue of, of you know, access as, uh, as our audience uh, has pointed out. So uh, Vera, I think we have uh, more more comments, questions in the, yeah. the, from the audience? These are mostly comments. Um, you know, there are some comments about COVID, but I don't think that relates to, um, to us, <laughs> uh, you know, at this point. So I see that quite a few people were really happy that we had, uh, uh, but here's a question from Robert Spitch. Do you think there is a general Slavic view of the world that is pessimistic? If so, is it founded on idealistic expectations for humanity? failure of art, education, politics, etc. No, I don't see that it's pessimistic. Uh, I don't see that Slavs are just crying people. I think that Slavs know how to laugh, and but they are very different in this category. So Serbian humor and Czech humor have nothing in common. They're both Slavs. Croatian and Slovenian which is very close, it's completely different way and approach to what is funny, what is not funny. So I don't think that exists one Slavic way of being happy or unhappy. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have a few minutes left. Uh, we don't have to go, but uh, we certainly um, can have some last questions. And I would just say to, when you mentioned uh, uh, Billy Wilder, he was the one who would always say, what would Lubitsch do? You know, so that was the, there's always this, uh, that, that we, we have some, some standards that are for us, like, you know, I want to, you know, be as good as he is or was. Uh, and I think that the one good thing to say for streamers, uh, if I may, and um, I'm, I will always go, I, I still go buy my ticket and watch films on the big screen in art house theaters that streamers might be an option that will open up some more for uh, foreign films, uh, international cinema. And uh, um, there are actually, there are some American independents. We, we have them actually coming to our festival because that's where they get to see the movies. They can't travel to all the Eastern European countries. And a lot of them had uh, Makaveyev and, uh, you know, and people like you as their teachers. Uh, so they go and see the movies for these, oh, let's see what the crazy Eastern Europeans are doing. Um, and I will just mention one film that um, last year is a completely independent American film, The Killing of Two Lovers. I mentioned it to Aida. And uh, they just work outside of the system and, uh, and it's possible. So th there's no, no, no. flicker, it's flicker sure. of hope. It's possible. It's not so impossible to make the film it became impossible to came to the theater. Oh yeah, to, yeah, oh yeah. That, that's, and that's why they are ending up on those stream, yes. Streams. So th that's, it's, you know, you can with iPhone today make the film. It's, if you decide and you really want to make the film, you will make the film. But then what to show the family and then, that, that's a problem. 
you know, if you spend three, four years making one film, you don't want to go to this small screen. Wow. It looks like the main question of the panel is how to survive outside the system, any system. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they, uh, on all levels. I think for all of us, it's the same. It's the same thing uh, uh, that we all try to do what we are doing um, against all odds. So, uh, what, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yes. What uh, are the odds that you are finding? Plug in. <laughs> Okay, this has nothing to do with Raiko, but it has everything to do with him and, and what we do too. So Seattle has recently closed one of its two remaining video stores, uh, Reckless. But the last remaining store, Scarecrow, actually was founded by someone who was a huge, huge East European film fan. Uh, we have a collection that is not available on any of the platforms, and it's still couple of times bigger. So now actually Scarecrow is doing a lot of uh, mail renting. And uh, actually it's like a citywide project of keeping this uh, video store as now a cultural archival institution. So if you want a really, um, you know, older film or film independent is big there anything that you can't find anywhere or on any platform, Scarecrow would probably have it. That's one thing. Second, I will, send, I, I will send you my films and you can give them. I think we actually have them. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I think we're on top of that. Uh, but secondly, I just want people to know Zagreb University also has many battles. So it's, it's um, I agree with what Raiko was saying, but I have to jump in. There were all these battles about the new Deccan and actually the, the provost uh, went against the will of the university and, and uh, decided that they were not gonna confirm the new dean. But it's a little bit, the society there is a little bit like US under Trump. You know, from the outside, it looks like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. But on the inside, you see there are really a lot of people from students through faculty who are fighting. But as Raiko says, it's, it's really, it's a backward slide, so it's very hard to do. But a question, your, co your cooperation or uh, collaboration with Ante Tomic, I could not believe you could do it before Karaula because he's just like, he cannot do a sentence that's not funny. And you tend to be much more serious. And so Karleja with Ante Tomic, if I had to make an oxymoron, that would be my idea of oxymoron. Like, who's the least probable person to write a screenplay on Narubu Pamiti on the edge of reason? Okay, I can get it. It's it's not Pavicic, it's not, you know, any of these new, it's Ante Tomic. Never, ever. So I'm I'm not gonna ask what the page is, but I'm I'm dying to find out. And if I, you watch the film, I will send you the script. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to see it. And I, I really wish you all the best with that because I think that would be a, a, like a breakthrough project to make Karleja with a smile, you know? <laughs> no, it will not be comedy. It's, it's not comedy. <laughs> I cannot imagine it being, but even, even not to be, you know, at the end of, on the edge of reason, you really want to just open the window and jump out. That's, that's about it. Spavati, spavati, you know, sleep, sleep, and that's it. Uh, so anyhow, that's all. That, that was more of a comment than wishing you good luck with that project. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have uh, a few minutes. We really uh, should close uh, uh, because it's uh, an hour and a half, and we don't want to keep any anybody. But we can uh, certainly maybe do this again. We should do this again. Clearly, we can, uh, uh, you know, the same group, and we get together and uh, uh, and just have another conversation. And God knows there are many topics. So, but, yeah, I, I just wanted to share with the audience what we chatted about before we opened up the panel and circle back to Raiko's book, which is really like a cultural archive for all of us uh, to, to mine in and to, to carry with us uh, for all kinds of reasons and, and, and purposes. Uh, and, and it has a literary edge and it has a film edge and it has a sociological edge and so many edges that I can't even begin to list here. So thank 
you, thank you, Raiko, for, for giving that to us. It's a huge gift in addition to your films. Thank you to all of you. <laughs> thank you, really. From deep of my heart, you really make my day. It's fantastic what I heard from you. I don't believe you that it's so fantastic, my book, but Thank you very much. <laughs> you, you, sh you should believe us and, and have a glass of one of those amazing Istrian wines that you're oh, getting for free because we can't buy them anymore. Those no, three no, guys. I, I'm buying them, but just for the little money. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I, uh, let's thank Seafest also for putting this yeah. on. Vera, you did an excellent job. This was a wonderful salon on film. Thank you. I'm thank a board you. member. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Stitch. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, really, for doing this. Uh, no, of course. This is we are the place. We, we are, I'm the warrior. I'm fighting to get the movies, and they are all subtitled, and they are all, you know, great and diverse, and they come from 19 countries. Uh, and um, I've had my share of experiences where they say, Well, why do you show films from that country? You know, it's just uh, that's been an interesting question, but that's for another conversation. So it, it's possible. 17 years, um, actually going into our 17th season, we will uh, continue to do this and show, you know, really a, an array of, of different stories, different filmmakers uh, from these. Some of them are very, very small countries, but they're great. So I'm, I'm very proud and thank you all. I mean, this was the panel and Raiko, thank you so much. I have put the link for the book. Please get the book, read the book. It's a wonderful companion. And now that we are getting into the holidays, I think you would really enjoy having this book as, as uh, uh, the uh, surrogate Raiko with you at all times. Uh, it's a great companion. Thank you Raiko so much for everything that you do. Yes. And thank you, the wonderful panelists. Uh, I hope we will continue to work together. Uh, let us know what we can do for you. We are here, an open platform, a nonprofit. Everybody's welcome. If next year we're having person events, please come. Please plan to join us. Thank you, Eva. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you for our audience.